Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to start um, by saying that it is a pleasure to be talking to you today, even if I'm not really talking to you per se, you are um, watching this recorded video. And I wanted to apologize that um, I won't be talking to you live, but when you're having this class, um, it is 3 a.m. So it's really, really late or I know uh, super early here. So I decided that I will not be um, on my best in the middle of the night. So it will be much better if I record this video and then um, you can reach out to me with any questions that you may have um, about my presentation just at any time of the day. So but rock and roll. Um, my talk today uh, will be titled The Honesty and Economy on a Highway, um, Ukrainian Sex Workers' Narratives of Morality and Exchange. And I am really grateful that Kevin invited me to um, give this presentation and to share this research that I did um, a couple of years ago for my um, master's degree at the University of Alberta. Um, I haven't really talked about this research for some time, so I may be a little bit rusty. I hope um, you will forgive me for that. So, um, before I kind of jump to outlining my argument and stuff, I think that it is important to know that sex work is a really heterogeneous phenomenon. So when we are talking about sex work, um, it, is also, it is always important to remember that sex work is really an umbrella term for a variety of different phenomena. So sex work may be happening indoors and it may be happening outdoors. And um, usually we are subsuming under the single term sex work, very different phenomena like escort, webcoming, uh, working in a brothel, uh, working together with a colleague in rented apartment or working in a street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, sometimes, uh, the definition of sex work becomes even more broad and it includes um, exotic dancing, it includes hostessing, it includes um, working in the porn industry, it includes um, sugaring and the like phenomena. So um, also people who work in the sex industry, they may be self-employed or they may be working for the third part parties. And it is a also important to remember that not everyone who is um, in sex work works for money. There are some people who may be working there for money, but also there may be people who are working for different types of compensation. For instance, they may be compensated in goods or services, or they may be uh, compensated like in some other way at all. And um, I was also talking about sex work as an umbrella term, and I decided to have an image of an umbrella when I'm talking about this, because um, a red umbrella, it's an international symbol of a fight for sex workers' rights worldwide. So I decided that it, um, some nice, uh, it's, a, it's a nice symbol. Okay. So also when we are talking about sex work, we um, should remember that there are really different modes of regulation of this phenomena. And um, I decided to talk a little bit about regulation because quite often, the moment I start talking about sex work, people start asking me about different types of regulation of sex work, but also how it is regulated in a certain context. It, um, really impacts what people think about it. It impacts how other people think about it and um, a lot of other things. So um, just we should know some of the basics. So just um, to make it really brief, uh, the three main modes of regulation of sex work are decriminalization, criminalization, and legalization. And there are, of course, different ways to mix uh, elements of those three models. Uh, decriminalization means that there are no punishment for sex work and sex work-related activities in the country's criminal code or uh, some other codes that regulate the behavior of the citizens. Then um, there is criminalization, right? And um, Criminalization may be of 
uh, different varieties because it may be clients who are criminalized like for instance in the nordic model where the selling of the sex is legal but the purchase is not and we can see this model in norway in uh, sweden in iceland and um, canada and by the way we can see decriminalization in new zealand and in a few states uh, in australia and then there is also legalization. Legalization means that uh, sex work is legal and it is regulated. So the state basically mandates how you should get um, your license, where you should get your license, and um, what you can and cannot do with this license. And also, quite often, when sex work is legalized, it means that there are certain areas where it is permitted and there are certain areas where it is prohibited. And uh, you all probably know that this legalization model, it is something that we can see in Germany, it is something that we can see in the Netherlands, for instance. So um, Ukraine is a little bit different beast here. And in Ukraine, uh, which is the side of my field work where I did most of my um, field, like not most, oh, all of my field work for the master's degree and where I am now doing my field work for the doctoral dissertation. In Ukraine, sex work itself, it is an administrative, meaning a civil, that is not a criminal offense. So um, if you're caught on um, doing sex work, then the police officer can write you a fine or um, ask you to do some like community, community service according to the administrative code. However, organized sex work that is managing a brothel, procuring or um, sutanerstvo, that is like pimping and being a third body in sex work, all those things are criminal offenses and they are regulated by the criminal code accordingly. And usually if you are caught uh, doing something like that, you may face and you usually do face a couple of years in a couple of years in prison. However, I should also say that um, the line between when a person, um, when sex work is, uh, is being classified as an administrative offense or as a criminal offense, it's quite blurry because, for instance, a couple, a couple of women are working together, they are all in sex work and they are renting an apartment together and they are all um, chipping in in order to pay the rent for this apartment, but the apartment is like the lease is written only in the name of one of these women. So in Ukraine, technically this woman in whose name the lease is, she can be charged with pimping or managing a brothel even though technically, de facto, she was just like another sex worker working there. Or we can also see that um, this fine line between like criminal offense and, uh, and the civil offense, when, for instance, one sex worker, um, she's being called by a client and she says like, oh, I don't really have time to uh, offer you any services now. So um, I'll give you a number, a phone number of my colleague, just call her and maybe she will be able to help you today. Like on the one hand, she just gave a number of her colleague, right? But on the other hand, this um, act of providing a client with a number of a fellow sex worker, it may be treated by the state as procuring and it may be classified as a criminal offense. So as you see, this line as how a certain act is classified, it may be quite blurry and it kind of depends on um, who is doing the classification, like for what purposes and a lot of other factors. But um, as anthropologists, I think like our job is often like to look at these classifications and to basically ask, ask, right, so why is this certain act classified this way, but not this way, and how this classification is also context dependent. All right, so um, I don't um, really know how your geography of Ukraine is, so I decided that um, 
before kind of like proceeding with my research, I should briefly talk about the location that I am in now and where I did most of my research. So um, as you can see on the map, um, here is Ukraine. And so it's, um, it's, in, it's located in Eastern Europe. It borders Russia um, in the east, Romania and Poland in the west, and Belarus to the north, and it has um, Black Sea in the south. And um, the city where I did most of my research for, uh, for the master's degree, most of the research that I will be talking to you about in just a moment, it was the city in the central Ukraine. So, right, you can see it uh, on the map here. And, the city name was Kropovnitsky, and before 2016, it was called Kirovohran, but then the name of the city was changed. And um, I am often asked uh, why I chose this particular city to do my research, and the answer is pretty straightforward, context. Um, I had... Um, I had contacts of an NGO that was founded by former sex workers who, become, who became a human rights activist and sex workers rights activist. And so they founded, if I'm not mistaken, in 2008, a small NGO um, to help fellow sex workers. And since then, the organization has been growing. Now it is a national uh, organization and it also has um, branches in some of the other cities, and also they moved the main office from um, this city, Kropovnitsky, to Kiev um, a couple of years after I did my field work in Kropovnitsky. But also Kropovnitsky, it's a really interesting city to um, be in and to research because um, it was uh, an important industrial city during the Soviet times, um, and there were a bunch of different enterprises and those enterprises produced stuff like heavy and light machinery, different textiles. Um, however, from Perestroika, meaning from the late 1980s and then especially in the 1990s, um, the fate of many industrial enterprises in the city uh, um, became sadder because Many of these industrial enterprises, they closed. Um, there was really like, no money to, to keep them going. So unfortunately, almost all enterprises that were kind of like booming during the Soviet era, they, they are closed now. And a lot of people, unfortunately, who, who worked in those enterprises, they lost their jobs. And there is now um, quite a high unemployment rate in Kropovnitsky. So quite often when you are walking to, through the streets of the city, you can see people on the pavement just like selling stuff, some homegrown produce, just some stuff that they um, inherited from grandma or basically like whatever they um, can find in their garage or whatever they can find at their home. So there is a lot of this, um, what we call spontaneous vending, just when people are selling on the pavement whatever they whatever they can find whatever they can spare essentially and um as you may mention uh this high unemployment rate it kind of it is like one of the reasons that more women they started doing sex work and also i should say that not all women about whom i will be talking just in a moment, they are um, sex workers 100% of their time. No, sometimes they may have some occasional gig that um, lends them more money than sex work. But then, for instance, this gig ends and they transition back to sex work. Then they land some other job. They transition out of sex work. So for some of them, sex work is not really a permanent occupation, so to say. So um, quite often um, when we are talking about um, sex work, well, it, it becomes a rather contentious issue and it becomes really a topic of vehement debate because um, 
there is uh, this because the exchange the exchange that lies at the heart of sex work it's an exchange of sex or some emotional attachment or something like that for something else right so it is this conundrum of money and intimacy that usually prompts a lot of discussion that usually prompts a lot of debates among people so um really one of the reasons why sex work is this very like contentious topic right it's basically because it's this um exchange of intimacy whether it is a sexual act or something else is really like at the heart of this occupation right and in contemporary societies we often tend to regard situations when money mixed with intimacy with some kind of suspicion we often think that these exchanges they are fraud or they are like less authentic or something else and um a lot of sociologists and anthropologists are looking at this way that we treat sex work in contemporary societies they propose the hypothesis that well uh, we find sex work so so suspicious so um uneasy to talk about because well in contemporary societies quite often when we think about sexuality and money we think of them as things that do not mix and should not mix because we quite often think about um, sexuality and intimacy as something that belongs to the private realm and money as something that belongs to the public realm however um quite often right um this is just this is not so right this is not the way that it is happening in the real world this idea that money should belong uh in the i should belong as an ideal situation in the public realm and sexuality and intimacy should belong as an ideal way to the private realm uh, sociologist Viviana Zellis had termed it a hostile world hypothesis, right? So she says that we have this hypothesis that money and um, intimacy and sexuality, they belong to different worlds, so they should not and do not mix. However, she says that, well, when we look at how this at, when we look at how like people function, right, in the real world, and this is what we as anthropologists do, we can see that there are many situations, in fact, when money and intimacy, they do mix, and da -da -da -dum -da -dum, money does not always poison this kind of intimacy. For instance, people often sign prenups. They hire babysitters to look for their kids. They hire some uh, help to take care of um, our elderly members of the family. We hire dog walkers and cat sitters. Does it mean if we hire a dog walker and we don't walk our dog ourselves, does it mean that we stop loving the dog? I don't think so. When your parents hire a babysitter to look after you while they go to the movies, does it mean that the parents really stop loving you? I doubt this. Does it mean that the babysitter does not like you and uh, will allow for anything to happen to you because well they're simply being paid they're doing it for money i don't think so i would think that a babysitter would probably be really invested in this job right so um when we when we look at how people function in the real world we actually see that money and intimacy they do often mix and there are plenty of situations when money and intimacy mix and money does not really poison intimacy so people like keep all these attachments to one another so how do we explain it and it is a job of an anthropologist to explain like why we think that these two things should not mix when in fact they continuously mix right and uh, when i was um when i was in the field and when i was talking to sex workers, I noticed that they are pretty well versed in this idea of 
this hostile worlds hypothesis, even though they do not call it. Um, they, they are not using academic jargon to talk about it in this way. So um, they often knew that people regard sex work as a suspect activity because of the because money or some loot or some services exchange hands and because they were offering sexual and uh, or emotional services to their clients. So they knew quite well that there are a lot of content, contentious issues um, arising when people are talking about sex work. And um, they knew that because of the way they are earning money, they were often seen by many people as dishonest people, and they were judged because of their activity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, as I learned, as I was talking to these women, um, many of them, they really insisted that sex work, in fact, was an honest job. And they also pointed to like multiple parallels that existed between sex work and other types of activities. And just for the next couple of minutes, I really wanted to focus on this idea of honesty and how the sex workers that I was talking to, how they saw honesty in sex work and basically how they used this idea of honesty in order to justify this exchange that lies at the heart of sex work. Um, so you can see um, this quote from one of the um, one one of the women that I was talking to. Um, I will call her Ilana, and of course, all the names that I'm using in my research they are pseudonyms to make sure that uh, the real identities of my participants are protected because um, it is really important for us as anthropologists, as ethnographers, to make sure that we help to protect the identities of participants when they ask us to do that. And uh, that, because basically, well, that's the basic minimum that we can do for them, right? They graciously let us um, into their lives. They help us basically to do our research by allowing us to shadow them, to accompany them and, in exchange, we usually offer them anonymity, confidentiality, and protection in our text when we when we are using their stories in order to try to conjure some kind of academic theory. So um, back to the quote. So Ilana told me the following when I was talking to her about sex work and this um, idea of um, sex work and that there is this exchange that that is at the heart of that sex work that makes a lot of people really uneasy and uncomfortable so she said the following well i want to tell you that yes every woman every woman that comes to a bar is selling herself when she comes to a bar to meet a guy she does it for something and not because she wants just to sit around him chat with him when he buys her drinks well, it is all good, but what do we have in the end? You live with him, go to his place, have sex with him, give him a blowjob for what? For a glass of beer? Forgive me, or for 300 grams of vodka? You sold yourself, we can say so, without knowing it. Well, knowingly, but how do I explain it to you? It is something totally different in sex work. Someone can buy you a glass of juice instead of alcohol, but you will still live with him and do it. And here in sex work, you have a price. You come, you have a price, and people have to pay you this price. And in those situations, meaning in the bar, it is negotiable. They pretend it is because of love. Yes, a one night stand because of love. And the majority of women does it. You can go to any bar now and look at the girls, how they dress up and in different ways hint that they are sexually available. So you can see that in this quote, Ivana is really insisting that sex work is kind of like a more honest activity than one night stands or other stuff that is happening in clubs at bars. Because in sex work, both parties, meaning a client and a sex worker, they are clear about the expectations, they are clear about the obligations that arise out of this exchange that they are about to engage in. And um, I should say that Ilana really was not the 
only person who um, framed sex work in such a way. I also heard numerous other women talking about sex work in a similar manner. And here you can see um, two other quotes, one from Nelia and another one from Xenia. And I'll just read you a quote from Nelia. And Nelia, she's also, she's often referred to by other sex workers as a bad friend of sex work because she has been working permanently in sex work for more than a decade. So she once told me a following story. A truck driver slowed down near me and offered me um, 100 rubles, meaning Ukrainian hryvnias, for a blowjob. I told him to fudge off. He told me that I disappointed him and that he wouldn't come here for me again. I told him, thanks God, I'm not doing that for a hundred. If he thought that I would back him, he was wrong. I'm working here, not giving alms. Then you can also um, read the quote from Xenia. It basically uh, draws on the same idea like of honesty um, and of like sex work as being like a separate occupation, as being a work in itself. And um, listening to these narratives, thinking about this idea of honesty and talking to women about it, it really made me think that um, when a crop of Nitsky sex workers frame themselves as primarily economic actors, and um, this really helps them to kind of like shift the focus from what is being exchanged to how it is being done in sex work. And essentially what they are hinting at is that, well, when you're going to a nail salon to have your nails done, you're not really treating a job of a manicurist as a suspect job, right? Because like the manicurist will do your nails and then you will pay um, this man or this woman some money. So you don't see this exchange as a suspect, right? So why would you see sex work as suspect? It's just another service job. It's important to look not at what is being exchanged, but at how it is being done, whether the parties were clear about the expectations, whether the parties were clear about the obligations that arise, that arise out of this exchange that they are about to engage in, and whether kind of like both parties follow these um implicit contract that they engaged in. So um, essentially, sex workers, again, um, are trying to shift the focus from what is being exchanged to how it is being done, whether the transaction was fair and um, honest, licit or illicit, and whether all parties were clear about their roles, about expectations, and about obligations. And uh, well, quite often um, in anthropology, we talk about exchange, right? Which is not a surprise because exchange, it's, an, it's a part of our lives. We often engage in different types of exchanges almost every day, not almost every day, multiple times a day. And sex work is, um, this, is one of the exchanges that people may, um, occasionally engage into during their lives. And so I thought that before I proceed talking about sex work and sex workers' narratives, I will briefly also talk about exchange and modes of exchange and different types of exchanges. So in anthropology, right, uh, when we're talking about exchanges, uh, when we're talking about economy, uh, we often talk about market exchange, we talk about redistribution, and we talk about reciprocity. So you all know really well what a market exchange is, most probably. When you go to a coffee shop and you say like, oh, one cappuccino, please. And the bartender says, oh, just you should pay me this sum of money. And then you give them or you give the cashier this sum of money and then the cashier gives you your drink. Well, this is an example of a market exchange, right? Then there is a redistribution. And a classic, classic example of redistribution is state taxation, right? So the state is taking a little bit money from each and every of its citizens in order to um, pull them all together, in order to accumulate them, and then to make sure that everybody gets back as much as they need. 
And then the third type of exchange is this idea of reciprocity that can be generalized, balanced, or negative. And general, generalized reciprocity, it's, this, um, it's based on this idea of sharing. So people give and receive freely. They don't keep like any list of who has given what to whom and when. So there is really no reckoning of things that exchange hands. And there is also like no reckoning of how much time has passed since somebody gave someone a gift. And an example of a generalized reciprocity will be raising a child. So uh, when people have a child, um, they start to buy food, they start to buy clothes for this child, right? They may pay for different um, teachers to come and um, to come and teach this this child you know, like English or dances or something else. And also people from the vicinity, different relatives or neighbors or friends, they will also come and they will uh, bring gifts for the child. They will, I don't know, buy diapers, for instance, they will um, gift their time and babysit this child while parents go to cinema, for instance, and stuff like that. And no one will really keep a list of what they gifted and when, right? It would be really awkward if you are um, on aunt and uncle or some friend of your parents like showed up at your do doorstep and said like, oh, remember 20 years ago, we babysitted your child for three hours while we were in a cafe, mm -hmm. right? So we want to be paid for that. No one will do that. Or if people do that, that would be really awkward. And the moment they do it, the relationship will be terminated right? because we all assume that when we contribute time or when we give gifts in such a manner, it is, uh, we don't expect anything in return. So the next type of reciprocity is this idea of balanced reciprocity, which is a more or less direct giving and receiving. And an idea, um, you can see balanced reciprocity on birthdays, during Christmas time, um, quite often or when you are choosing a, gift, a Christmas gift for your friend, you're most probably thinking about the gift you gave them last Christmas, they gave, they, um, you gave the gift you received from them last Christmas and stuff like that because you want to make sure most probably that the gift you will be giving your friend it will be more or less an equal gift that you will receive from them right because for instance nobody really expects a friend to gift another friend a car for christmas or for birthday right that would be like that would be totally inappropriate many eyebrows will be raised because this is not what we usually expect. So a key aspect of um, balanced reciprocity is that really uh, without reciprocation within an appropriate time frame, this exchange, it will falter and the social relationship might end. Because for instance, if you uh, gift your friend something for their birthday and then a couple of months pass and your birthday comes and the friend just doesn't call to um, say happy birthday, doesn't show up with the gift. And then and the situation like that happens a couple of times, well, you may really reconsider whether you really want to be friends with that person, right? You may say that, well, you know, I don't feel that we, you are reciprocating uh, that you're investing in this friendship as much as I am. And the uh, last type of reciprocity is negative reciprocity. And it is the most impersonal type of reciprocity. It's really a situation when one side attempts to get something for nothing or almost nothing. Um, so basically when one side expects to uh, get something at the expense of the other side. And examples of negative reciprocity are gambling, raiding, um, internet scams, and other stuff like that. So why I was boring you with all that stuff about modes of exchange? I was really doing that for a reason, because when I was um, 
in the field when I was um, talking to sex workers, I noticed that quite often the clients would drop off gifts for sex workers and they would not really expect a lot in return. So as anthropologists, we often love to talk about gifts and you probably uh, already heard about or you may have even read Marcel Moss, who um, is an important anthropologist from the beginning of the 20th century. And he has this amazing book called The Gift, um, where basically he um, analyzes this logic of reciprocity that lies at the heart of gift giving. And basically, um, the question that he asks in this book is why humans feel obliged to reciprocate when they receive a gift. And his answer is that when giving and reciprocating gifts, uh, whether those gifts are material objects or time or something else, this exchange of gifts between humans, it creates links between the people involved, says Moss. So essentially, he says that gifts, gifts are more than just think, things that we give. Gifts, um, again, whether they are material or immaterial, they irreversibly tie us socially to one another. And um, I was thinking a lot about it when I was uh, looking at how gifts circulate between clients and sex workers. And um, just the situation that prompted me to think about it was the following. I was hanging out on a highway uh, with a lot of women and Nelia, this veteran of sex work, she was among them. And a really expensive car um, came to this group of women where a group of sex workers uh, with whom I was hanging out. And so like the car slowed down, um, a guy came out of the car, he took a, big basket with some like makeup stuff with some like perfumes and he just gave it to Nelia I gave her a kiss um, on the cheek and then he got in the car and he drove away and it was more or less a usual thing for her she was like yeah sure I often receive gifts from my clients and I started talking to more women about gifts um, about clients and I started noticing that oh well Quite often, um, sex workers were talking about how they valued permanent clients, and it also seems that the feeling was mutual because they managed to develop these um, very affectionate and emotional relationships with them, uh, with these uh, permanent clients. And those gifts also were one of the ways to cement these emotional, to cement this affectionate relationship that existed between a sex worker and between the client. And um, I also noticed though that quite often it was the clients who were giving gifts to sex workers, but not vice versa. So I was asking for some for, for a while, how come these gifts are kind of, um, how come the directionality of these gifts is one way that these gifts, they flow from clients to sex workers, but not vice versa. Yet the relationship between people is not, is not terminated. How come? Isn't this contrary to what economic anthropology teaches us? And so I spent some time thinking about it. And then I was like, no, Daphne, you're all wrong. You have not been thinking about it in the right way. Because again, like who told you that gift should be just like this material thing, like um, a box of perfumes? No, gifts are, and gifts can be, and often are immaterial, like time or something else. And then I started to think about it more. I started talking to women more about their clients and the relationship with the clients. And basically I, uh, notice that, yes, economically, the relationship between sex workers and clients was asymmetrical because quite often the clients were economically better off than sex workers. So it was expect expected by sex workers that the gifts they will receive from clients, those will be economic gifts, those will be material gifts. However, the gifts that sex workers were kind of giving to the clients 
those were immaterial gifts. That was the gift of time. That was the gift of providing the client with a safe space to enact some of their fantasies or stuff like that. So, um, right. So when I was when I started thinking about it in this way, um, the picture became much, much clearer and I finally got the answer as to how do these gifts flow in such a way that this relationship between permanent clients and sex workers is not terminated by, but is reinforced by this gift because uh, the material gifts flow from clients to sex workers, but immaterial gifts flow from sex workers back to clients. So the circle is perpetuated and the relationship is cemented further. So um, returning now to really what is at stake and why I think it is important to pay attention to sex work and to study it, um, well, three of the main things that are, um, are important for me, I decided to put them on the slide so you can see them in front of you. So um, what I wanted to stress is that there is often more to sex work and to sex workers' relationship with their clients than meets the eye. And though sex work is built around, as someone may say, a mere economic exchange, um, it's often more complicated than that because sex work quite often involves complex forms of intimacy, affection, and emotion. And um, there are scholars of gender, scholars of sex work like Denise Brenner, Nicole Constable, Elizabeth Bernstein, who um, look at this exchange that is happening in sex work and um, they think of, and they describe it in terms of performances, like Denise Brennan does it, for instance. She says that these Dominican women that engage into various types of sex work with European and American men, they kind of, they perform love, but they do not really feel love. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have a dog here. As, uh, as you can hear, I'm so sorry for that. It's, it's a puppy. So um, Denise Brennan says that um, these Dominican women, they don't really feel love for the men with whom they engage into various types of activities, but they perform this love. And Elizabeth Bernstein, when she's analyzing um, sex work, she's often saying that, well, it is bounded authenticity that is happening uh, between sex work and their clients. So that she's uh, trying to say, I think that, these um, feelings that we may think are circulating are not 100% authentic, but I think that we should push a little bit further and we should go a little bit further than that. And I would also challenge you and probably like provoke you and, inv and invite you to think about how we could not just like challenge this idea of authenticity like Bernstein does for instance, but also maybe we should deal, deal um, with this idea of authenticity away completely. Because, well, from what I have seen, this idea of authenticity does not really help us explain how multiple relationships they stay meaningful while being often like sustained through different um, exchanges, through different um, money exchanges or some other types of exchanges. And so I just wanted to um, um, to conclude by saying that though sex work is really built around an economic exchange, it often involves uh, complex forms of intimacy, affection, and emotions. And quite often forms of intimacy that we assume are built around love, right? They are still often linked to various commercial practices and economic exchanges. Again, returning to the babysitter example, the fact that parents pay a babysitter does not mean that the parents do not like their child. And it does not mean that a babysitter who is maybe just doing it for the money does not like the child. No, it doesn't mean that. So the boundary really between this commercial intimacy and 
authentic intimacy is way more blurred than we think. So does this idea of intimacy really help us to understand anything? I am not so sure, but I would be really happy to hear what you all um, think about it. And so um, just one of the last things I think that what anthropology teaches us to do, it teaches us to contextualize and it teaches us that there are really no universal rules that in order to understand what is really happening and whether a certain frame, framework is really helpful in, um, in shining a light on a certain phenomenon, we have to look at the context. We have to kind of like um, count on the importance of context. So just um, to sum up, what is important to note is that those, a lot of exchanges, they take place in the sphere of intimacy. Through all these exchanges, people create obligations, confirm a challenge dependence, and also acknowledge that all of us are deeply social beings who are embedded in various social networks and histories. So um, I think that I have used almost all of the time that was allocated. And I wanted to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I would be really, really glad to hear them. So don't hesitate to reach out and um, let me know about your question either through email or on Twitter. And thank you and have a wonderful day. And my apologies once again for my puppy barking in the middle of this lecture. I hope it was at least funny and maybe you woke up some of you who fell asleep during this boring talk. Thank you and bye.